Day 2022, the technically difficulty-filled Mother's Day. That's okay. <laughs> God is still worthy of praise and glory and honor, and I, it is indeed my pleasure to be before you this morning and to welcome you all to our Mother's Day service. We don't have anybody on Facebook for me to greet, so I'll continue to greet the mothers this morning. For those who are mothers, for those who are grandmothers and mothers of whatever your mothers are, I heard you guys talking before the service. God bless you this morning. The title of our message this morning is God Uses Mother's Faith to Save a Nation. God Uses a Mother's Faith to Save a Nation. Let us begin today on this Mother's Day with an article that I read in the Associated Press dated June 29, 2020, entitled, China Cuts Uyghur Births with IUDs, Abortion, and Sterilization. The Chinese government is taking draconian measures to slash birth rates among the Uyghurs and other minorities as part of a sweeping campaign to curb its Muslim population. Even after, or even as it encourages some of the country's hand majority to have more children. While individual women have spoken out before about forced birth control, the practice is far more widespread and systematic than previously known. According to an AP investigation based on government statistics, state documents, and interviews, the campaign over the past four years in the far west region of Xinjiang is leading to what some experts are calling a demographic genocide. The state regulatory subjects, or should I say regularly subject, subjects minority women to pregnancy checks, forces intrauterine devices sterilization, and even abortion on hundreds of thousands. The interview and data has shown us. Even while the use of IUDs and sterilization has fallen nationwide, it is still rising sharply in Xinjiang, which is where the Uyghurs live. The population control measures are, are backed by mass de detention, both as a threat and as a punishment for failure to comply. Having too many children, is the major reason many are sent to detention camps, the AP found, with parents of three or more ripped away from their families unless they can pay huge fines, police raid homes, terrifying parents as they search for hidden children. After Golner Am Amirzak, a Chinese-born Kazakh mother, had their third child, the government ordered her to get an IUD inserted. Two years later, in 2018, four officials in military camouflage came knocking at this mother's door anyway. They give Omizak, the penniless wife of a detained vegetable trader, three days to pay $2,695 fine for having more than two children. If she didn't, they warned she would join her husband and millions of other ethnic minorities locked up in internment camps for having too many children. God bequeaths children on you, she exclaimed. To prevent people from having children is wrong, said Omizak, who tears up even now while thinking back to that day. They want to destroy us as a people, she recanted. As I read this article, I couldn't help noting the irony between the Muslim minority and an oppressive nation desperately fighting to have the right to have children and a Supreme Court fighting happening right now in my own home nation, the land of the free and the home of the brave, and those who are desperately fighting for the right not to have children. Omizak's words seem ominously and poignantly prophetic. God bequeaths children unto you. To prevent people from having children is wrong. They want to destroy us as a people. In Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, the wisest man who ever lived lamented, what will be, will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. From time immemorial, since God created man to live on the face of this planet, and ever since, there have been nations, it has been understood that if you control the population birth rates of a people, you can control the future health, wealth, and prosperity of a nation. This is not a 21st century invention or stratagem. 
It's as old as the Bible itself. And we see this exactly played out in our story today in Exodus chapter 2. Most people know the story of Moses. And we know that he was one of the greatest prophets in the entirety of the Bible. Come on, we all saw the Ten Commandments, right? Let my people go. And he takes the big stone and he chucks it at them from off the mountain when they were getting down below while he was getting the law. We all remember that movie, right? We know that we probably even know that Moses offered the first five books of the Bible. And that he was the, the savior God sent, you know, that God used to rescue his people, the Jews, from 400 years of captivity and slavery in Egypt. Most people know that. But how many people know who Moses' mother was? Have you ever heard of a name? Anyone? How many people know that without the faith of Moses' mother and father, they may never have been a Moses to begin with? Oh, sure, God could have used some other man with some other name to bring his people out of bondage, as he promised he would do. But he didn't have to. Because he had two faithful parents from the tribe of Levi who defied Pharaoh's edict that all male children born to the Hebrews were to be slaughtered at birth. He had a faithful mother who hardly anyone knows, even to this day, named Joshebed. J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D. Yes, Joshebed is the mother whose faith God used to save a nation. In Exodus 1, it recounts what happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants after they settled in Egypt with Joseph to escape the worldwide famine of their time. It says that the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. That means they were having a lot of babies, y'all. They multiplied greatly, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So sounds like we went from immigration to saturation. Don't get nervous. I'm not going to stop talking about the border. You can breathe again. Take it easy. A new king came to power, a new administration, if you will, to whom Joseph meant nothing. He didn't remember all the wonderful things that Joseph and the Jews had contributed to saving that nation. And instead, he said, look to his people. The Israelites have become too far numerous for us. There's too many of these Israelites. This is too much. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them. Or well, they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they may join our enemies and fight against us and leave this country. This country is going to become a country that we don't no longer know, is what they were saying. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them into forced labor. But the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread. This was true of the New Testament church, by the way. The more Rome and the Pharisees and the Sadducees oppressed the disciples of Jesus Christ, the more Christianity spread and grew throughout the Roman world. But I digress. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the field. And they whipped them and lashed them. And in their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. This is what it says in the text. I'm not making it up. This is Exodus 1. Hmm. Sounds strikingly similar to what the Europeans did with the Native Americans or the West Africans, my ancestors. But again, I digress. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see it as a baby boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let it live. The midwives, however, watch this, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. <laughs> they were lying, by the way. <laughs> so we hear in this example, we see an act of civil disobedience on the part of the midwives, who knew what the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, had ordered. But for conscience sake, they could not comply with his request. And they literally lied to the king at the risk of their own lives to do what was morally right. Would that we still had people today 
who were willing to do what is right in the eyes of God. Would we have people today who were willing to sacrifice and do what is morally right, even when it's uncomfortable for you personally? Do what is right in the eyes of God and not what's in the right in the eyes of man. That way we represent God's will and not our own. <coughs> so that again the world would actually know by our example what is right and what is wrong. Too many of our churches have grown complacent and weak need and lack the intestinal fortitude, courage, and faith that these mothers, these, these midwives, showed in the face of certain death. In this nation, at least today, although I can see a time when it might not be the case anymore, what, what, what do we really risk when we do what is right? All we really risk is our reputation and maybe our invitation to the country club or inclusion in polite society when we stand firm on biblical principles. But still many today capitulate to society's whims and the evil directives and fail to stand up for what we know is right and wrong in the eyes of God. Beloved, we would do well to remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 33. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. But these midwives stood up and did not obey Pharaoh's wicked edict, and God gave them families of their own. Why? Because of their faith. God blessed them with families of their own, and they became mothers, whereas before they were childless. These midwives may or may not have been Hebrews themselves, but they protected God's most vulnerable people, the male children born to Hebrew women, from Pharaoh's evil intent to destroy Israel as a nation. God used the faith of these women to help save a nation. Which brings me back to our text and the faith of Moses' mother, Jacobin. Once the midwives refused to cooperate with Pharaoh, he implemented Plan B, so to speak, and he orders the, everyone in the nation to be on the lookout for Hebrew boys born to Hebrew mothers. And if we find them, cast them alive into the Nile River. It is into this backdrop that Jacobin gives birth to Moses. Even though she already had two other children, by the way, Moses' elder siblings, she had Aaron and Miriam already, who are Moses' elder siblings, she still gets pregnant again and gives birth to Moses, which in and of itself was an act of faithful defiance. When she sees the child, when she sees him, her husband Amram and her realize that this is no ordinary child and that there was something special special about him. The theologians tell us that this phrase, no ordinary, or in the King James Version it says goodly or comely, indicates that he was strikingly beautiful. Kind of like myself, by the way. <laughs> but not just an appearance. There was an anointing. There was something about him. It was as if his mother was looking at his eyes and she could see his destiny in his eyes. How many mothers have looked at your child and you could see your child's full potential and destiny as you held them in your arms, as you swaddled them and as they cooed? You, you beheld them and you could just dream and, and perceive what this child could really be. Any mothers want to say amen to that? Amen. Okay, I got a couple. Any mothers want to say amen to that? Amen. amen. There was an anointing there. There was something that they saw, and they said, oh no, this, this, this can't be. Remember, it had been almost 400 years. They knew that this child was going to be something special, someone great, a man of renown. It had been 400 years since they had been in slavery in Egypt, and there was a prophecy that said that the Messiah would be sent to save them from bondage. So all of these women were looking for the birth of the one who would be their deliverer. So when they looked into the eyes of Moses, is that what they saw? It is what they hoped for. It is what they were believing for. It is what they had faith for. But even beyond this, Jacobin and Amram made a decision, an act of faith, 
to keep this child hidden and to raise him, even though it meant certain death for them and their two other children. How remarkable to hear about a mother who was more concerned about the life of her child than her own. You have to recognize that doing this really looks extraordinary. It's an extraordinary act of faith in God. Think about this. How do you hide a newborn? Mothers, how do you hide a newborn for three months? If he was anything like my children, one cry for food, poop, or colic, we would have been found out in 30 seconds. But they went even further than that. James 2 tells us that faith without works is dead. So let's look at the works of Jochebed, this mother of faith in Exodus chapter 2. When when she could not hide him any longer, she got her papyrus basket for him, and she coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. You know, the same river where all newborn Hebrew boys were supposed to be thrown to their death. This word, by the way, for basket, is translated to mean ark, which is the same word used for ark that Noah was on when he was saved from the worldwide flood, by the way. So Jacobet puts Moses in an ark in the same body of water that all the newborn babies were supposed to be drowned upon their birth, and she waited, and she prayed, and she waited, and she watched, and she prayed. What was she waiting for? She was waiting for God to intervene and answer her prayer. She knew she couldn't keep him safe. She knew she wanted him to live and needed him to live, but in order to do this, she was going to have to do all that she could do and then trust God for what she herself couldn't do. Did you hear that, mothers? You do all you can for your children, and then you must trust God to do what you cannot do for yourself. You give your children the best opportunity you can, and then you pray and you wait and you watch for God to fulfill the work in your children. Do you have children that are away from Christ? Do you have children that do not know Christ, that are living scandalous, crazy lives? You do the best you can, and then you pray and trust God to do what you cannot do for yourself. She's walking by faith, not by sight. But she has hope that God will grant her success in what she has planned to do. She had a plan. She had a better plan than Rebecca, Bible students. What was her plan? Well, let's take it out. Let's check it out. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. Now, do you think Jochebed didn't know that Pharaoh's daughter took her bath there at a certain time of day or week? Of course she did. And I suspect that she maybe even knew some things about Pharaoh's daughter and the type of woman that she was. There are bonds that women share, especially as mothers, that men we just don't comprehend or understand. Look at what the midwives did, for example. Even though it could have meant their death, they just could not kill innocents. Women, for the most part, are wired to, to not do such a thing. Your motherly instinct, if you will, kicks in. So I venture to say that Jacobed was hoping and praying and believing God that this heathen woman, this heathen princess, Pharaoh's daughter, when she saw the striking and beautiful son, would have a similar reaction. What happened? Verse 6. She opened it, and she saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry. She was moved with compassion. For him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Ah, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. So, what do we know that she knows? She knows what her father has decreed. So, there it is. The motherly instinct has kicked in. And just as Jacobed had hoped and prayed, and then right on cue, as I'm sure Jacobet had told her to do, by the way, his sister, Miriam, pops onto the scene. 
Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She says. As if that wasn't the plan all along. But again, they didn't really know what was going to happen that way. They were hoping and praying that it was going to happen that way. What if Pharaoh's daughter, who clearly knew the edict of her father, like everyone else in the whole nation did, obeyed her father and threw Moses' body back into the Nile? This was definitely and certainly a possible outcome that Jacob had, had to wrestle with as she placed her son in the ark on the Nile. But what we see happen is our God, who tells us plainly, without faith, it's impossible to please him. You must believe that he is and that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And we see here in this story how God rewards the faith of Jacob. Pharaoh's daughter says to Miriam, yes, go and get the mother or go and get a woman to do what you said. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby, nurse him for me, and I will, here it is, how do you like this? And I'll pay you. <laughs> so the woman took the baby and nursed him. So now instead of being under the threat of death, of having this third child after the edict to kill all Israeli boys, Jacobed is being paid to care for her own, for her own son to keep him alive for Pharaoh's daughter. <coughs> Who doesn't want to serve a God like that? Now she has the opportunity, by the way, to share the stories of their family heritage and the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenant with God that he made with the people so that one day he would become the deliverer of God's people, the purpose for which he was born, all expenses paid by their enemy. Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's ways, or women's ways, please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Yes, beloved, God rewarded the faith of Jacobed and had the daughter of Pharaoh, the enemy of the Israelites, protect the future redeemer of his people. Verse 10 then says, when the child grew older, she took up to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she named him, by the way, Moses, which means I drew him out of the water. Hebrews 11, 23 says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. Do you know that you and I are no ordinary children? That we are redeemed children of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do you know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you know that God knows how many hairs are on the top of your head or that used to be on the top of your head, Ernie and Gordon? Mothers, do you know that Psalms 127.3, it says children are a gift from the Lord and they are a reward from him? Jochebed, the mother of Moses, understood this. And God used her faith to save the nation of Israel through her children. Through her loins came Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron, the first high priest, and Moses became one of the greatest prophets who walked and talked directly with God. He is the archetype of Christ, who would one day walk and talk among us as one of us and save the entire world from its sins by being the walking, talking, breathing fulfillment of the law given to Moses, ratifying a new covenant in his own blood that would redeem us all from our enemies, Satan, sin, death, and the grave. And just like in the story of Moses and his mother, Jochebed, God would use another mother's faith named Mary to bring our Savior Jesus Christ into the world. Here again, we see in the life and faith of Moses' mother, Jacobet, a prophetic foreshadowing of the redemptive plan of God for all mankind that would come through the body of a mother, Mary, who in faith said, may it be done to me according to your word, and she burst the Savior Jesus Christ who would redeem us all. Yes, beloved, this is how God used the faith of a mother to not only save a nation, but to save us all. My question to you today is when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, will he find faith in the earth? Amen. 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 Amen.